Well, I want to thank you all for being here. One of the reasons I wanted to do this is I think more people need to know about Prince. He has an amazing story. He's an amazing guy. And right now we're all sitting in a living room in America. And that feels very normal to us. We've all been in a thousand living rooms throughout our lives. Uh, but this is a big deal for Prince and, and where he comes from. And so I wanted to bring him here and ask him questions so he can talk about his life because uh, where he comes from and where he is right now uh, is a very significant thing. And I think you'll realize that the more that we, um, the more that I'm, I'm able to ask him some questions. So Prince, thank you for being here. Thank you. Prince, uh, why don't we start, I think it'd be fun to start with uh, where you were born. So if you could describe the village you grew up in and your family. I was born in Malawi, in Africa. I know most of you don't know Malawi. Uh, I was born in a, a typical Malawian family. I was born differently, like most of you here, because I was not born in the hospital. I was born in my mother's house before she went to the hospital. Our house is many miles from where we live. And most of it, it wasn't just my mother. For example, in my family, it was me and my sister that were not born in the hospital. Uh, it's not all that abnormal. Many people in my village were born uh, in their own house. So my mother's mother, who is my grandmother, she's almost, she's 93 or 94 now. She's the one who nursed my mother to give birth to me. And um, yeah, I grew up in the village, uh, in a Malawian village. Uh, I did my school in the village. And um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the school that you attended? You can start with how old were you when you first went to your first class? I think I, I went to the first class when I was seven or eight is when uh, I, I had an opportunity. I was allowed, accepted to go to school. And how, what were the classrooms like? Uh, you would have maybe, we were almost 200. I remember for me to, to, to pass from standard one, which here you say grade one, to grade two, I was on position 89. So we were a lot of kids in our class and actually even my, my my parents were really proud that i managed to be on that position so uh even now there's the classes are really huge like huge number of students in work in one class and one teacher so yeah yeah and what's it what's it like for someone to go from being in a school like you were in to you ended up in college so what was that progression like uh, it's really hard. Uh, for example, for me, I don't understand how I managed that. In my family, we were six, now we are four, and I'm the only one who had, who has, uh, who had an, a privilege to go to college. Uh, the rest of my siblings, they didn't have that opportunity. And it wasn't by my parents. It's, w when I finished my high school, I stayed like eight years. I didn't know. My parents talked to me. I say. We don't have any money to send you to college and we don't know what will happen, but just, just do what your friends have been doing. So it's like maybe for the girls in my village, you finish your high school and that's really cool. If you finish your high school, that's an achievement. Most of them, they, they drop off and, and they get married because uh, the parents will not do anything. Men, most of the people that have graduated from uh, high school, whether men or maybe ladies, they just end up getting married in the village. Um, many of them, they'll not be doing anything. At least maybe they'll have a privilege to do a business, maybe a small business, or maybe they'll do well in farming if things are working well. But most of them, for example, the people that I went with to a primary school, when I go to the village, um, there's a very big gap between me and them. And most of them, they ask me, I say, how, how, how did you do this? Or what happened to you? Where did you go? Or who did you meet? And they have lots of questions that they don't understand. So before we talk about what uh, your progression up to college mm -hmm. and what set you apart, let's talk about what's normal for people from your village. So a normal person, they go to school in your village and they grow up. What, where do they get water? What do they eat? How much do they eat? Okay. Uh, How the, much money do they make? Don't talk about money because money is it's not, it's not something that they... Okay, everyone needs money to live. You need money. But these are the people that they have no way on how they can get money. There's no employment in the village. Uh, the only way you can get money, 
uh, it's maybe to work in somebody's farm. Okay, maybe somebody has, has, has a piece of land and then you go to that person and say, uh, I'm looking for a, a piece work, a job. So maybe a lady or maybe a, a, a man will go and, and he'll work in that piece of land and he will receive some little money. Mm -hmm. And this money is not maybe to, they cannot do anything about that apart from maybe buying food or maybe buying some few clothes for their children and so on. So that's normal for, for them. That's how they live. That's how they survive. So if they don't have money, what do they have? Maybe you could talk about their healthcare options or their, uh, where they get their water from. Uh, the people in the village, when they don't have money, actually they, they rely on the government to give them the healthcare facilities like hospitals, and uh, the, the government cannot do everything. The people, the conditions that I've just told you, um, I'm, I'm slightly over 30 years, and the conditions are still the same in my country, in my area that I come from. There's no hospital, and uh, people walk a long distance. Like, people are still, uh, are still giving birth even in their houses because they cannot go to the hospital. So what you're saying is 30 years ago you were born, and yes. you were born in your mother's house, yes. and it's 30 years later, we're in the year 2018, the and there's still people living the exact same still way. still the same. Not much progression has happened since then. Mm -hmm. And how far are people walking to get water in your village? People in my village, they don't get, um, like maybe, okay, if your village is lucky, it means you have a borehole, you have drill water, you have a safe well. But in my village, people go straight to the river and they drink from the river and they drink with their own livestock. So their animals that they are farming are mm. drinking from the same place? That the they're... same place, the same place. And also maybe the ladies that are washing their clothes, the ladies that are, you know, they have babies and they're washing uh, whatsoever the wets from the baby and some people are drawing water maybe half a kilometer river, from there, yeah. down the river, they are drawing water. They will not even treat this water. They'll just take this water and they put it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a container whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So they're drinking from there. And what are the consequences of people drinking that water? There are lots of uh, problems like waterborne diseases, like especially during the rainy season, it becomes worse. I have my grand, uh, I had my grandmother who died of cholera. That was when I was just a little boy. Mm -hmm. And by then cholera wasn't, um, wasn't, wasn't common and people did not know that it was cholera. And um, it was after somebody else, after my grandmother died, somebody else had the same type of sickness that killed my grandmother. And, uh, uh, and at least this person, the people had, um, they had to carry him to the hospital. And this is how they carry him. They make something like, I don't know whether like a ladder you know a ladder. Mm -hmm. So they make a small ladder and then they put some cloth there and then they put that person and they put it on their shoulder, maybe four men, and they'll be running to the hospital. And they rush that person to the hospital. And then she was, she, that's when the doctor said that this person has cholera. And that's when the people knew that, oh, that lady died of cholera. And what are the hospitals like in Malawi, in, in your region? Hospitals are uh, places that you go and you're not sure whether you get help or not. You go there, you just go there because you have faith that at least maybe I'll get help, but you are not guaranteed that you have help. The times that you go there, you're sick and you really want help, and what they'll give you is just painkillers. And maybe you you have malaria, but they don't have uh, they don't have uh, malaria treatment. And um, it's I don't know about here. I told you that one of the things that I want to see here is the hospital. But the, the, the hospitals are really crowded. You go there and you, found, uh, you find people that haven't been helped. For example, my father, I went with my father to the hospital in 2008. She had prostate cancer. And we went to the hospital and we came in the morning. It was Monday morning. We came in the morning like around 5 o'clock. We stayed there after around 6 o'clock. No one attended to her. And I could see my dad is losing energy and he's dying. And I was really fu furious. I went to this doctor and said, what are you guys doing? I think I have to move him to another hospital. But th that didn't help. And a week later, my dad died. Okay, so 
that's, that's the type of the hospitals that we are talking about, where you are going there, but you're not sure whether you get help or not. So you've gone over hospitals, you've gone over your water situation, your education. Uh, what are some of the positives about Malawi? Malawi is beautiful. If you want to visit a country in the world, I would, I would recommend Malawi. It's beautiful. I feel like Malawi is yet to be discovered. There are lots of places that you go there, you say, where are the people? <laughs> this is so beautiful. I wish this was opened up for everyone to come and see. Malawi is beautiful. The people in Malawi are so friendly. Uh, I'm not just smiling to you because I'm in your country. If you come to my country, everyone will be smiling like the way I'm doing. Everyone is so friendly. And it's not just because uh, uh, you are, you're from another country, but it's because that's how we live. We're all friendly. In Malawi, uh, I, I was talking to Greg this other day, I say, even the, 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 the people that we're talking about, these are, we can say, poor people. These are less privileged people. But even if you can go to them, and ask a cup of water, they'll still give you. And they'll smile at you. They'll still be generous. They'll still find reasons to be good to you. That's really great. And that's my experience too, by the way. I spent three years living there. And it's, it's obviously, there's a big wealth discrepancy between here and there. And, and sometimes people wonder, like, why would you spend three years in this other country? And it's a testament to the people there. They're, they're really great. They're just like Prince. Yeah. So, Prince, tell me more about... Um, your transition from high school to college and the time in between there. How did you even find out about African Bible colleges? Uh, when, I, when I was in my final year in high school, I met this guy, Cedric. We were together in this youth camp. And he told me that, you know what, I'm going to African Bible College. So I never heard about that. Uh, my, my ambition was to be a pastor. I wanted to go to a theological college. And then I graduated from there and then I became a pastor for a church. So that's what I wanted. I said, okay, go ahead to African Bible College. He had the same ambition, but he wasn't accepted to be in a theological college that we all wanted. I wasn't also accepted. They did not take me in. Uh, one thing, it, it was maybe because it was church funded and it was just almost for free. You don't have to pay any money. And we were all not taken and he went to African Bible College. So when he went to African Bible College, two years later, I met him, and he was completely different. I said, which college did you say you were going to? So he said, African Bible College. I said, give me the, the application <laughs> forms right now. I really want to go there. <laughs> because uh, Cedric was coming from a family just like mine. And I said, how did you manage? So he talked to me over that. He said, uh, we do, there, there are lots of ways on how you can raise money. On your own. I said, okay, that sounds good. So yeah, he talked to me about that and uh, I said, I, I think I'm going to this school. So yeah, and in 2011, I started preparing to go to African Bible College. I was, I was, uh, I was taken to, to learn at African Bible College. And tell me, how much is uh, tuition at ABC? I don't know in, in dollars, uh, but it's, it's, it's more than, it's close to $1,500 per semester. Okay, how much kwacha? That's 894,000 kwacha. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And how much, wh where would you get 894,000 kwacha? How much kwacha is the average person living on a day in Malawi? Great, Le to be honest with you, it was really crazy. I had people in Blanta, I was living in Blanta. So Blanta is, is a, is a place a little bit far from Lilongwe, the capital city, where African Bible College is. And many people in Blanda don't know about African Bible College. And by then I was not doing anything. I was just a guy who was just moving around in town, has got nothing to do. No one could employ me. I, I'm just having this certificate from the high school. I was once employed, but you know, I'm not full, I'm not well educated. So whenever the, uh, whenever the boss is, is angry, the first thing he'll do is just to fire you. Okay, he has got nothing to do with you. Maybe he had a quarrel, a fight with his wife. He'll just come and say, you're fired, Prince. You go, you go ahead and take maybe. So they don't care about, they, they didn't care about me. So I was just moving around in the, in the city and I'm telling people that I'm going to African Bible College. There was this, one thing that I had was faith. I had that faith, I say, I'm going to African Bible College. So I was going around telling people, I say, I really need money. I want to go to college. So these people thought I'm crazy. But I still had that faith. I say, I'm going to college. 
next year. Why did they think you were crazy to think you were they going to They thought I'm crazy because I had no money. Where would I get money? Okay. And actually, one of my friends came to me and said, he, was, he, he, he works for this other organization. And this organization has a um, teacher's training college. So he came to me as somebody who has a better plan. So he sat with me and said, Pris, I know you want to, 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 you want to go to college, but I know you struggle with the tuition. So I have a better plan. You go to the, uh, to the teacher's training college where I work. So you go there for free. The, the tuition will come from my salary. I said, okay, but I said, but God is not leading me to that institution. I am 100% sure that I'm going to African Bible College, and African Bible College it is. Mm -hmm. So this guy was really, I think he was frustrated. He thought, I'm not, uh, um, I'm not grateful of the offer that he gave me, but that's the faith that I have, and I, I can't let anyone to take that away from me. So... Uh, came 2012, I didn't have even the money to go and sit for the entrance examinations. But then it was 4,000 kwacha. I don't know how, how, many, how much it's is like that. It's like eight bucks, by the way. Like, yeah, yeah, close to that. So I went to the same guy who wanted me to go to the teacher's training college. I said, do you have some money? I want to go and do the <laughs> entrance exams. And <laughs> this guy really loved me. He really loves me a lot. And he said, okay, go ahead. So he gave me the money. And I went and wrote this entrance exams in. I passed, and I'm going around to, in, in the houses and showing the people that I have been accepted to go and study African Bible College, not knowing that these people, although they are smiling, but they have that worry at the very back of their minds and say, where will he get the money for the tuition? But that wasn't something for me to worry about. Because I said, I'll do anything. Listen to me, I had that crazy faith whereby I was talking to my shoes and say, these shoes, I wear them in, co in college, okay? So I was taking care of this shoe. I say, I don't want these shoes to get worn out because I want to use them in college, okay? So that's, that's, that's how crazy I, I was. So I, I talked to different people who helped me to, uh, to raise money. This guy whom I'm talking about, he gave me some money. There's this other guy, he gave me some money. And the, there's this other also guy, um, uh, oh, this, this man, he came to Malawi. I was working with him. He's in Northern Ireland. He's from there. And he helped me with some money. And I paid uh, part of my tuition. And when I came in college, I said, now I'm in college. And I said this prayer, there'll be no time that I'll be chased from class or I'll not be late from class because of the tuition issues. Maybe something else, but not tuition. And I said, amen, and I started walking around in college and enrolled for, for the guarding scholarship. So I was a guard. I was working in class in the morning, in the afternoon, I'll be in class. In the evening, I'll go and do guarding in African Bible College. So I was sitting on the professor's house, on your house <laughs> when you're working there, yeah. and I'm guarding, I'm having my book here, I'm doing my assignments while I'm making some money. And yeah, I had... God has been amazing, honestly, because, um, yeah, let me just stop there. I don't want to preach to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's, let's uh, wrap up in, in the next few minutes about, let's talk about how you got to America. What were the things, the things that happened I at ABC that yeah. led you to be here today? Okay. Go ahead. Think, uh, you want me to say that now? Yeah, what were the things that happened, yeah. Uh, when, I, when I get to ABC, I was... Um, I was really excited. I knew in my heart that this is, this is something that will leave a mark in my life. Coming to ABC is one of those things that even those people, I had the people that were waiting for me in Blunt and say, he has left for college, but soon he'll be coming back. He's going to be chased from college. But these are the people that are texting me now and say, I have seen on Facebook that you are in US, <laughs> okay? Coming to African Bible College has left a mark in my life, not just for me, but everyone that, uh, who knows me, my parents, my siblings, and everyone, because I met you, okay? Uh, I went through the corridors of, of the college. I met different people. Uh, there was Cosolino, 
and he's one of the people that inspired me. Uh, there are lots of people that I met that helped me a lot. And one of them was to meet Greg. I met Greg when I was a sophomore. And, but then I was leading a couple of guys to a, prison, a youth prison ministry. So Greg, the first time when he came to Malawi, he joined us. And we were, we were riding this small car and we were like seven or eight of us. And Greg was driving. <laughs> <laughs> and actually he broke that car. Up until <laughs> the guys broke. Yeah. yeah. They, they repaired it, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, since then we started, um, I didn't know him and, and I, I didn't think that, I, didn't know, I, don't, I don't think, by then I was not thinking that Greg would be one of the people that will stuck in my life forever, <laughs> okay, because we didn't greet each other. I don't know if we did, but after that, it was over. Then we started meeting around in the campus, and we started talking, and uh, we talked about the, uh, the youth prison ministry, and we started going there. He donated the Bibles, and uh, we made videos. He had a passion of going out in the village to help the widows, and... Um, in the orphans. That's what he used to do. I was still going ahead with my ministry and helping the, the youth ministry. So by doing that, the college has helped me to learn. It opened my eyes and also to meet incredible people like Greg Glyer. I, I love what I do now. I love, working for, uh, I, I, like, I love working for him. And I'm happy that even working for him has not just helped me to be part of uh, the people that have impacted the communities, but also has brought me here in the US. <laughs> so everyone in Malawi wants to come here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now I think we'll um, get, well, now I think what we'll do is we'll do a question and answer time. And if you have a question, please raise your hand. I think it would be fun if you share with everybody. How you got a visa okay. to come to the States. Mm -hmm. What did they ask you? It's very difficult to get a visa to come to the States in Malawi. The lines are long and he goes there and I'll let him tell you the story. He gets, he gets an offer from Jeannie yeah. saying, uh, I got a ticket, but you need a visa. So what happens next? Okay, um, my coming to US, like I never thought of coming to US like this soon. This day I'm, I'm in my house with my friends. We are watching a movie and Great called me. He doesn't usually call me. He, we, we text a lot. So he called me, and at this time, he doesn't, we don't talk that time. And I'm wondering what's going on. Why, why is he calling me? Why can't he just text me? And I'm walking out uh, from, from the house, and I'm picking up the call. He asked me, I say, how, if you were to come to U.S., how soon would you want to do that? I say, I don't know, but maybe, maybe after J July or so, I don't know. So he said, okay, you'll be coming to US soon. Somebody has offered to pay an air ticket for you. <laughs> My mind was blown off. Like, <laughs> how can I celebrate this? <laughs> okay, like, am I really, is this real? So, yeah, I, I was really happy, excited. I went in the house. I told everyone, my friends, they were, they were really happy and they couldn't believe it. So I was still worried about the process of getting a visa to U.S. I say, buying, somebody buying a ticket for me is one thing, but getting a visa to come is another. So actually, I was delaying. I didn't want to be sad. Great was telling me, go and apply for your visa, and I'm making some delays. I'm trying to think about that. I say, I don't want to be sad. This is a huge, this is wonderful, but how can I go about it? Because I have two of my friends who have applied almost two times, but they were denied a visa to come to U.S. They had people who bought tickets for them. They had the same type of great news that somebody has bought tickets for you and you'll be coming to U.S. So I said, what's different about me? So I prayed over, over that and said, okay, let me give it a shot. So great uh, was still pushing me, go ahead and apply for the visa. And I started the, pro the process. Um, I have a brother who works for this other guy, Michael Barker, and he has been to US a couple of times. And I talked to him, give me some tips. How do you guys do this? So he helped me and great helped me a lot to fill the form. 
So I booked the interview with the consulate. So I went there, they told me uh, uh, there was this time that I booked and my time, uh, I mean, I woke up in the morning, I ran to the, to the embassy and um, I found lots of people that are there. Some of them are pastors, some of them the, the students, some of them the business people, some of them I don't know them, like there are lots of people and they really want to come to US. So I'm almost like the last person to come. And on my way, as they are screening me and searching me before I met the person who was interviewing me, I met this other pastor, he was coming down and the guard was asking me, I think they knew each other, how did it go? He said, it didn't go well, maybe I'll be coming here next month. And I began to worry and say, if the pastor has been denied a visa, how about me? <laughs> So, yeah, and I could hear other people, because they tell you the results right away, say, we have accepted you or maybe we have denied you. What you'll be waiting for is just a, a letter um, signed by the consulate or maybe the ambassador, whosoever is in charge, writing you that we have denied you visa. So I'm still praying in my heart and I'm shaking and I don't know how I'm going to do it. So my name was called and I went there and I'm standing there, I'm smiling, I have that, this confidence. And then he's asked me, why do you want to visit US? I say, I'm visiting the Glyas and say, what are they, what are those? <laughs> <laughs> Not what are they, say, what are those? I say, those are the people, <laughs> actually. <laughs> so, so he said, okay, uh, how did you know them? So I said, they came here just for a short visit and their son, Great guy was stuck here. He became a missionary and he was working here. And uh, he's my friend and he's also my boss. So he said, what do you do here? So I started explaining stuff. Like I just, I, I was just explaining things. I said, we have donacy, we have homes. We build houses for orphans and widows. And we have donacy. Let me tell you about donacy. It's a crowdfunding application. You have it in your phone. So I'm, I explained it to this guy. He doesn't, he doesn't want to hear that. And I'm just <laughs> explaining the stuff and to say, you have donacy. You can help with uh, the little that you have. Maybe $5, $10. You can make a huge impact. I go around taking photos and posting it on donacy. And he said, stop right there. Come at 11 o'clock tomorrow and get your visa. I said, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I said, I knew it. If I'm going to tell you this, you get tired of me. And you just want to <laughs> <laughs> so I left the embassy. I came back home. All my friends couldn't believe it because I was texting them and say, I've just been accepted to go to US. I say, that doesn't happen oftenly. <laughs> yeah, so I thank God for that. Can you give me the context of your village? How many people are in the village when you say village or in cities? And, uh, how many are at African Bible College? Yeah. How many people were in the village where your, your mom still lives there, right? Yes. And your grandmother, who's 93, 94, she still lives there, right? Yes. Okay. So how many people are in those villages? Um, you talk of maybe 2,000 to 3,000 people in one village. This is a big village. And also the villages are divided into small, small villages that maybe you have 30 or 50 households. Yeah, but our entire village is 2,000 to 3,000 people. How many people share a borehole, uh, a well, in, for two to 3,000 people? Uh, like in my village, I told you, there's no borehole. Actually, my village is close to the, to the mountain, the big mountain, Mulanje. So in, during the colonial time, uh, the government was getting the water from the, from the, uh, from the mountain, and we had uh, tap water, like portable water. So as time went by, these were broken systems, and no one cares, no one is going to repair that. So there's no borehole. We, we once had a borehole in the late 90s or early 2000s, and it was broken. No one cares about that. And we've stayed without a borehole, a borehole for many years now. But recently we had a borehole, the well that we drilled, that you people donated towards. And um, we thought, the, the last time we checked, it was 2,000 2, plus people that would be using that borehole. But when we were giving this borehole to the community, the, 
uh, we had, uh, we received the latest statistics that the Village Development Committee gave us. They said this, this boho is going to serve 4,632 people. So, yeah, I think, I don't know if I have answered your question. Okay. Yeah. What does faith look like in Malawi and in your villages? Are a lot of people saved? Are they not? How did that happen? How did you come to know, Lord? In Malawi, you know, we were colonized by the British, and um, many people are Christians. Many people, you can almost in every village, if, when you walk into the village, you find two or three churches. And um, these people have a small church, they go there, they worship. Uh, that's the faith that they have. And um, it means these people, they hear the word of God almost at least once in a, in a week. Many of them, they go to church. But also there are some traditional beliefs that people believe in. And um, yeah, these are the people that have hope and hope in God. That's all I can say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, how important are things like theology in these remote villages? It's not very much important. What, you, okay, you know, in, in most of the villages, you never find a well-trained pastor. You just, people, you just find the people that were born in this village, they grew up in this village, they're not well-trained. Anyone can stand up and read the Bible and say whatever he thinks about what the verse says. And the preaching can just last this short, maybe two, three minutes, and they're done. They'll just say, you have heard what the Bible says. I have nothing else to add on this. This ends the preaching. God bless you. That's all. These are the type of preachings that you can find in the villages. So theology, they don't care, about, about, uh, they don't care much about that. It's, I think, I don't know if maybe it was the system that did not work, but that's the type of theology that you can find in the villages. That, that's the remotest places in Malawi. And what's the morality like of the pastors there? Are they moral, virtuous people, or do they get mixed up in other things? Um, most of the pastors are really disciplined people. They are devoted to the work of God. Most of them, I know them. And, um, yeah, and um, it's just maybe now that we can find some pastors as scandalous, but in the past it wasn't like that. But most of them, they are really devoted to the work of God. Uh, to the work of God. And you can find them that, I mean, you can see that these are the pastors that are working in the villages. Um, maybe the, he has, the one pastor has a lot of, a lot of churches to look after. And he, he visits that church maybe once in a year or twice in a year, sure. Um, what does your typical day look like working for GRAT at Homes and Donor C? Um, uh, I wake up in the morning and um, I was talking to GRAT, I say, Donor C, okay, I wake up in the morning and then I have to figure out how will I go to the village. We don't work in just in one village. These are different villages and the distance from where I live to the village is different. I don't have an office like the one that you people maybe work. Uh, I work from my room. My, my room, my bedroom is my office. If you walk there, you'll find the donor staff, you find the home staff, you find the whiteboard. I've written a lot of things, assignments or whatsoever. So I wake up, I look at the whiteboard. What have I written? Do I have an assignment today? And do I have to look for more projects? I look for the projects because uh, because I go into the village, I'm just like them. No one wants to ask anything from me. I'm just like them. So, but I have to figure out and say, how can I help these people? These are the people that I know that they need help. They cannot ask anything from me. And then I go there and I talk to them. I say, I'm going to help you about this. Like maybe the child is sick. She has malaria. The mother has no money to take this child to the hospital. And I don't look like somebody who can help them. But I'm just walking around with my phone in the village and I'm asking them questions. And she's, ask, uh, she's answering like anyone else is, ask, uh, is asking. So when I say, I think we can get this child to the hospital, it's when their eyes popped out and say, oh, this guy can bring help. Uh, and also the other thing is, when you come into the village and you're driving a nice car, it's when you, people are so attentive. Because you look cool 
with the car and you're moving out of the car and everyone thinks that you can help them. I don't do that. I, I go there through a push bike and I can walk around in the village like anyone else. The other thing is the cool part of it, it doesn't mean that I love doing that. It's hard for me to go to the village without a car on a push bike because it takes me hours to reach, to, to arrive to the village. But the, 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 there's something good about that because I can only help the people that really need help. If, if we were to announce and say, I'm coming next week on Tuesday and I want a list of those people that need help, the, whole, the entire village would turn into, uh, it's, it's like it's made up of widows <laughs> and, and orphans. Everyone is going to say, I'm a widow and I'm a widow because everyone needs help. But that makes me to, to only find the people that really need help. Like they're really desperate, they really need help. So, yeah, and also it's not just about finding the new projects, like people that we want to help, but also to make up the follow-up. Uh, this person received help, how is it going now? Uh, was that effective or not? So I'm a busy person. I don't spend, I, maybe during the weekend is when I spend time in, in town, but most of the time I'm in the village working with the people, the chiefs. I interact with the chiefs a lot and uh, trying to help and even also figure out ways on how better we can reach out to these people. So that's how my typical day is like. We'll do one more question. How, how far away from where you grew up is American Bible College? Is that someplace you can like go back and forth or you're there and you stay there? It's really far, like maybe five, five hours drive. Yeah, so, and also, I told you about my mother. So, uh, me and my mother, we are so close that the things that happen to me, I have to be careful whenever I tell her because it's going to break her heart. So, even when I was going to, to college, I had to talk to her over that. It's, actually, she, she has no idea about that. And she knows that I have to pay money for me to go to college. So... I have to explain to her. So when I went to college, it's like I'm saying bye to her for a couple of months or even a year. I, I could spend maybe the, whole, the entire year without visiting her or maybe close to that without visiting her. So it's really far from where I grew up to the college that I went to. And what does she think about you coming to America? She thought that I'll not go back to Malawi. She was really worried. And I had to convince her. I had to drive down to Mulanje to meet her and have two or three days of talking to her about that. So she had lots of questions. I say, why do you want to go there? Who said you should go there? And are you going to come back or not? Or maybe you have a girlfriend there or what's going on? <laughs> so I had to convince her. I say, no, uh, I'm just going there for a month and I'm, I promise you I'll be back. I'm not going to start there. And no, you want me here and I'll be back. So. One of the reasons that I have to go back to Malawi, actually, I, is to work for him and to make sure that things are working and also my mother needs me there. Sure. And your girlfriend. And my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> I have a girlfriend in Malawi and, and uh, she, she's, she, she's trying to find out how, what's going on here. She's following up the, and also I, and also I think she knows, uh, I mean, she knows about my mother a lot. So, She's doing that on behalf of my mother. Say, if, if, you, if you're going to start there, maybe your mother will be on my neck. So please, make sure that you're coming back. <laughs> All right, well, Prince, we hope that you come back to America, and I think we can give him a nice round of applause, and thank you for coming. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, feel free to stick around and keep eating and drinking and whatever we, you want. So are we done? And we're done. Yep. <laughs> you can keep talking to them, though, in real, in real life. <laughs> OK. Um, I feel like I should say something before we finish, whether you're going to record this or not. Let's record it. OK. <laughs> but it's really awesome for me to come here. This is not about me. This, is, this, this trip has opened my eyes. You know, the things that we think, I used to think when I was in, in Malawi, it's not how I think now. I thank God for Jean, because I was talking to her, I said, God has used me, you. Because from this trip, I believe a lot of people in the villages 
will be helped a lot. And um, this is not just about donacy. I believe this is about you to understand like how you can reach out to the people back in the villages. And if you have any questions about that, I'm ready. And also if you have comments and to see how best we can do that, I'm really ready to hear about that because together we can make a huge difference in those communities that have left there in Malawi. I think that's what I wanted to say. Well, I really do appreciate all of you coming. I thank you for giving us those closing words and, um, and for making this possible. And it's been an honor to have you guys listen to Prince. I, I've known him for like four years and, and I knew him when he lived in, when he was living in Malawi. And that was my only, the only context I knew him in. And now I know him as someone who's really good at bowling and paintball and he's got, <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it's, it's been great to have you here and he's here for a full month. So take advantage of it. Thank, thank you. you. I want to say thank you to all of my patrons, including Zach Bentley and Anna Bentley and Joel Nolet. Thank you guys so much for supporting me. I also want to say thank you to everyone else who you see on the screen and everyone else who is supporting me. You guys are making what I do possible. If you're interested in supporting me on Patreon, I would really appreciate that. I run an organization called Donorsy, and I work over 40 hours a week running this organization, and I don't take out a salary for myself. And so I'm making these videos in the hopes of creating some awareness so that I can raise money for myself to support the work I'm doing with Donorsy. If you want to check out more about Donorsy, I encourage you to look up the video, The Future of Charity, Donorsy's 10-Year Plan. Thank you guys for watching. I'll talk to you later. Bye.